The story of the 1984 Ruffman Circuit of Ireland was one of decimation amongst the top 10 seeds. The 600 fast and furious Irish tarmac stage miles saw the favourites drop out one by one. Like the 10 green bottles standing on a wall, after the Easter five-day motoring classic, there was just one green bottle left, one out of that top 10. Before the Good Friday morning, Belfast start, the top three seeds give us their views. Well, Jimmy, you've won three out of the last four circuits. What's your plans to make it four out of five? Well, I'll just try our hardest and see if we can do it. It's, uh, you know, unfortunately, we had a big problem last year on the first day and that mucked up the chances of making it four in a row. So we must try start again and try and make it four in a row from now. It's beginning to rain, Jimmy. Is it going to be very difficult to choose the proper tyre? Yes, this is the problem, actually, when it's like this, you know, where you've only got showers of rain. You can never really be sure that you have the correct tyres and uh, you can lose so much time if you're on the wrong tyre. So it's, it's a bit of a hit and miss, actually, when it's, when it's like this. It's either got to be all wet or all dry. It's very best luck to you, Jimmy. Thank you. Thank you. Henry Tavernan, you have lots of experience on the circuit. How do you think this Porsche is going to adapt to Irish tarmac? Well, uh, maybe I have some experience from this, uh, this rally, but I must say that uh, we don't have any experience with this car. Uh, we know that it's very nice uh, on the smooth fast roads, but uh, we, we really don't know anything how it goes on the fast and pumpy roads like you have here, especially when it's wet and uh, you know, the mud comes from the banks on the road, so uh, for sure it will be much more slippier than uh, ever I've driven. With the last few days, you've been out around the Friday stages doing your practice. How have you found them? Well, uh, I just uh, done them two, three times uh, because I had a rally in, in France, so I came a little bit late here, but uh, they, they're nice, uh, fast, uh, fast, special stages, except uh, like I said, that I think those pumpy, pumpy bits doesn't fit for us, but uh, it should be okay. Anyway, I like when it's practice, you know, so there will be no uh, surprises with the corners. Russell Brooks, you're the reigning champion and three times winner. What thoughts are going through your mind this morning? Oh, Jimmy, will it rain? Will the sun shine? You just don't know, you know, and uh, you wonder how the opposition are going to do. It's the first time I've driven the Opal Mantra on tarmac, so. We feel a little bit of a disadvantage there, but I'm sure at the end of a rally this long, we'll be able to drive it at the finish. But there's no water for it for Brooks this year. Just one mile into the first special stage, he's out with a broken prop shaft. And then there were nine green bottles. On the first couple of stages, it was Jimmy McRae and the Opel Manta 400 at number one. who battled for the lead with car number two, the Rothmans Porsche of Henry Teufel, with Henry fastest. At four was the Audi Quattro of former German champion Harold de Moot, lying in third spot after the first stage. Number seven here is B-seated Yorkshireman Chris Lord in the Volkswagen Golf, running in Group A trim. But local interest is centred on the three Mantas at eight, nine and ten. Bertie Fisher in the Shell Gold card example. Cork farmer Billy Coleman, a two-time circuit winner at number nine, supported by dealer Team Ireland and Dubliner Austin McHale in the NDT supported model at number 10. On the third special stage, Hamilton's Folly, suddenly it's McRae leading, by over a minute in fact, from second placed Harold de Moot in the far spitting Audi Quattro. Bertie Fisher and his co-driver Austin Fraser have moved into third place, just four seconds back. But where's the Porsche? A damaged wing and a flat tower provide the answer. The flying fin has had troubles, dropping him way off the leaderboard. The top half dozen are now completed by Austin McHale and Billy Coleman in fourth and fifth places, again split by mere seconds. Ennis Gillen's Ernest Kidney's Lotus Sunbeam is running at number 12. Ernest, making his once a year rally outing, is lying a splendid sixth place overall. But that Hamilton's Folly stage, with its many bumps and crests, over 20 miles long, caused many, many problems. The top drivers were glad to reach the service at Downpatrick and give us some of their views. Any problems so far today, Bertie? No, no problems at all. It's been running very smoothly so far. Uh, we've had a really clean run over those first three stages. 
pace seems to be fairly hectic up front, but um, we're sort of working on the principle that it's still a very long rally and uh, trying to settle ourselves in before uh, you know we get out of the stages without pace notes. So um, we're happy enough so far. Austin McHale, you've had a problem with your intercom in that last stage. Just how much time has it cost you? Uh, I don't know how much time it's cost. It's probably about 10 seconds, 10, maybe 15 seconds. It stopped working about halfway through the stage. But we get sorted out now in the service. Henry Tyvenen, you've had a few problems. Can you tell us exactly what they were? Yeah, well, we, we were coming uh, with the fifth gear and uh, over the crest and my plug fell down from this so we didn't have any connection with Ian and I didn't know where the road goes so we went off and had a pu two punctures and lost 10 minutes. And how much time has it cost you? Around uh, seven minutes. Okay Henry. In the now brilliant sunshine, three times winner Jimmy McRae leads the rally for a repeat run over Ballyduggan Lake and Hamilton's Folly stages. The Good Friday run is all about pace notes, high speeds and precision driving. However, one other top driver already gone is young Stanley Orr. He set joint fifth fastest time on the very first stage. Then his hired Ascona engine blew up, and ten minutes later he was sitting at home drinking tea. And it's back to those green bottles time again. Another one is about to fall. A Group A rover of Colin Malkin has mortally wounded rear suspension. It's rally nearly run. Look out for the various bits and pieces trailing under the rover. Some drivers didn't have the time or maybe the inclination to make pace notes. Look here for John Price's co-driver, Derek Davis, pointing the direction of the corner. They didn't make notes, and their beautiful Renault 5 Turbo is now lying at the back of the top 10. The top drivers were, however, all on notes, using all sorts of landmarks to demote braking distances and the severity of the corners, with Cork farmer Billy Coleman using trees as marker posts as well, even giving his co-driver Ronan Morgan horticultural lessons to differentiate between ash, oak and silver birch trees. However, driving on pace notes means total commitment from the rally crews and high speeds. Rally leader Jimmy McRae so very nearly came to grief second time over Hamilton's Folly. The notes said flat out, but gravel thrown onto the road over a crest told a different story from the first time over the stage. The Rothman circuit leader careered through a fence over a bank and into a field. His AC Delco Manta severely biased about but luckily with no mechanical damage. The Scotsman's lead was reduced, but still intact. When McRae landed on top of the bank, he let co-driver Mike Nicholson out to open the farm gate, drove round the field and collected Mike on the way out again. Nearly 30 seconds were lost, but it was oh so close to a disaster for Britain's only A-seated rally driver. Ten are gone. There were seven green bottles left. honours has taken an unexpected twist. Colin Malcolm has already gone out and in fact Ken McKinstry and Tim Bryes are fighting for the category lead. The person expected to do well, particularly with experienced Ulster co-driver Fred Gallagher reading the pace notes, was Finland's Juha Kankinen. Here he tells us the story of his problems. Lots of problems this morning. Could you tell us a little bit more exactly what happened? Mm, yes, in the first stage we just hit a little bit to the stone and of course break the wheel and, and tire and then we spin and break the steering arm and we lost about one and a half minute and then they repair it but it we had we had something 
seven minutes road penalty and but now it's okay. With the Friday run drawing to a close, Winston Henry in the Ford Escort was lying just off the leaderboard, having dropped three minutes with a puncture. The circuit's first day ended with a stage through the picturesque village of Glenau in County Antrim. Jimmy McRae was leading here, but not for long. His mantle was about to have a head gasket change, moving Jimmy from first to fourth place. Bertie Fisher, in second place for most of the Friday, was the new overnight leader. His shell gold card Manta hadn't missed a beat so far, and Fisher reveled in the pace notes. A perfect partnership with co-driver Austin Fraser as the noise of the Manta bounced off the Glenau stone walls. Harold DeMuth was now up to second place. His Audi engine had received attention at nearly every service area. Its complicated fuel injection system was playing up. The Bavarian was just 21 seconds behind Fisher. Billy Coleman now moved into third place. He was only 11 seconds behind the former German champion going into Belfast. The Cork man had achieved what he wanted on the Friday. Go easy on the Manta, but still stay in touch with the leaders. Sensational throughout the day was Henry Teutland. The Rothmans Porsche was up to fifth by day's end, from 35th after stage three. By far the fastest car in the rally. 9 out of 10 fastest stage time so far. Co-driver Ian Grinrod's pace notes were working well. As Austin McHale and co-driver Christy Farrell sweep down through Glenau, they are lying 7th despite those punctures. As we picture McHale, the rest of the leaderboard is made up of Ernest Kidney in 6th place, a flu-stricken Mike Dunyon in the Chevette in 8th, Davy Evans in the Nissan 9th, and John Price 10th. Limut, you had engine problems yesterday. How has it been for you so far this morning? Well, quite okay. So we are going now in the blind stages and of course I have a lack of experience. And on the other side I try to drive with no risk. So you can expect maybe I drop back a little bit. And you've been perfectly happy with the, those stages this morning, even though you had to drive them on the blind? Mm, yes. That's quite a new experience, you know. I never did a blind tarmac rally with a big quattro, and but it's working quite okay. We hope that everything goes okay for you, Harold. Thank you. Thank you. Billy Coleman in third position. At the moment, are you more worried about Henry at your rear than Harold and Bertie in front of you? Uh, I would just, just definitely say that if the Porsche keeps going, nothing, nothing is going to stay with it. You know, the way he's driving and it's obviously the quickest car in the rally. It's a question of whether it'll keep together. But uh, at the front, I mean, obviously there's only half a minute in it, you know, which isn't very significant at this point. But um, I'm very much afraid we're all driving too quickly for such a long rally. But then, unless everybody slows down together, <laughs> you can't risk slowing down. So it's a funny situation to be in at this point. We have all the stages down south in front of us. Won't that be very much your scene? 
Well, I don't know. We've never rallied that territory before, and um, you know, I, I think it's it's equal going for everybody, which is good. It's a bit of an unknown quantity at this point. Nice talking to you, Billy. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Jimmy McRae, you've had serious engine problems. Are you worried, or do you think it's going to be okay now? Well, I don't know. I think with the hell, some of the head gasket went last night, and we run two stages with the temperatures are very high. They've replaced the gasket, but they're still it's blowing a lot of oil out, and it's also using oil. So we don't know. It's if we get to Waterford, then it might be all right. But the car's down in power as well, so we just need to. I think the rings and the piston rings must have gone. They're leading class two overnight in the Sunbeam. News also of Tim Bryce slowed with a gearbox problem and losing his Group A lead. At the head of the field, it was still Fisher leading. Demut, Coleman and Teuven in second, third and fourth. The pace hot and heavy in the sunshine. All sorts of dramas were unfolding up in the hills, however, with the clink of those green bottles in the air as well. Billy Coleman had a puncture, losing two and a half minutes. Austin McHale had a suspension problem here, losing a little time. And Henry Teuthman, he just flew, moving up to second place behind Bertie Fisher. And the green bottles, yes, two of them. Three-time circuit winner Jimmy McRae stopped when his AC Delco Manton engine finally let go. The second green bottle going to Finland's Juha Kankinen. Yuha, after moving into 10th place overall and taking the Group A lead, the Finn's Toyota Corolla engine lost its oil pressure, and that was that. Kankinen in Finland means hangover. There was more than a possibility that the young Finnish tree farmer was about to acquire one. He had just taken the Group A lead when he was out of the 1984 Rothman circuit. We often hear how dangerous rallying can be. Accidents can happen so easily, as we are about to see. Luckily, the Ulster Automobile Club marshals have taken all the right precautions and no damage is done, but it could easily have been so different. A tricky junction and Demut reads it wrong. The two ladies very nearly had a 350 horsepower Audi in their shopping bags. That's how quickly it can happen. Toivonen, he reads it right and he's sitting on the same side of the car as Demut. Fisher gets it right, and notice the tape is back in position. As does Austin McHale, he gets it right, and they're both sitting on the normal side of the car. But Billy Coleman, sitting on the left, gets it wrong. That's just how easily an accident can happen. Ernest Kenny, you're in seventh place at the moment. How will you play it from here on? Well, you've got to have some sort of philosophy, and uh, there's a Porsche, an Audi, and a handful of Mantas that this car just can't live with. So I can't expect to do that, and I um, want to stay as close to them as I can, and in front of everyone that's behind, as easy as that. There is no way anyone can argue with Ernest Kidney's thinking. He was playing exactly the right game, but still having to motor hard to maintain his sixth position. The rally was now winding its way on southwards. From the Wicklow Hills, it was through counties Carlow and Kilkenny, Waterford, the Saturday night goal. The, the speeds were high, desperately so at the front. The rally cars under tremendous mechanical pressure. Suspension, gearboxes and back axles, as well as engines, taking the strain of the 100 mile an hour plus over the bumpy stages. Bertie Fisher was still leading, but only just. Henry Teuvenen was steadily closing that gap. Billy Coleman was in fourth place, while Ernest Kidney, as we've just heard, was sixth overall. Derek Davis was still giving his co-driver John Price hand signals, and they were lying in eighth place at this point. Former World Hot Rod champion Davy Evans, pictured here in his Nissan Datsun, was on his first ever rally, and he was holding an unbelievable seventh position overall.
fight for Group A was desperately close on the Saturday, but at last young Northern Ireland driver Alan Johnson, after making a steady and sensible start, has moved into the Group A lead with his C-Link sponsored Toyota Corolla GT. Fellow Group A runner Tim Bryce had been off the road in Sally Gap, dropping back. Car 64 here, Julian Raymond, was just outside the top 10, while Mill Street's Barry Duggan had a rear wheel and brake problem. The hard-charging Jenny Burrell was chasing Brian Wiggins for Group N honours in her little samba. Car 90 was Cork's Jerry O'Flynn in the escort, while Martin Grandin had to withdraw from the rally, unfortunately, on the sad news of his father's death. The sole all-lady crew were Marie Maloney and Catherine Tracy in the Opal. John Price, you're currently up to seventh place. Are you happy with your performance? Yeah, we've had a very good day today and uh, we've had no problems at all. The cars ran well and um, yeah, I'm happy at seven. And what about the stages down today? Did they suit your car in particular? Uh, yes, um, the last couple suited it um, and uh, probably tomorrow it'll be even better. So uh, we're hoping to improve on, the, on seventh tomorrow anyway. So you're going to give it 10 tenths from the first stage tomorrow morning? I wouldn't say 10 tenths, probably 9 tenths. Um, and take it from there. You can't drive this event 10 tenths, you'll never finish it. That's true, it's a finishers rally, John. Thank you. Thanks. How true were those final remarks of John Price's? The circuit is not yet at the halfway mark. Two days gone and three to go. The equivalent of many another international ahead and just over 50 cars still running from the original 90 starters. As the tired drivers head for Waterford and a night's sleep, yet another drama on the 1984 Ruffman Circuit of Ireland unfolds. Rally leader on Friday night and most of Saturday, Bertie Fisher and his co-driver, Austin Fraser, are stopped in stage 20, Ballycuddy. Another green bottle hits the deck. There are now four drivers left out of the original top 10. A disappointed, bitterly disappointed Bertie Fisher tells us how his dreams were shattered. Bertie Fisher, after a brilliant drive, you've had mechanical problems and you're out. Could you tell us what was really wrong? Yeah, we broke a half shaft on stage 20, about uh, three miles into the stage, going up a hill from a junction, half shaft snapped, and uh, that was it. We uh, radioed the service van and got them turned. They were halfway to Waterford, and they came back and into the stage, and we changed the axle. But uh, we were over at maximum time allowance whenever we got out of the stage. Are you right, Brian? And your stage time is on the way down. Have you been happy with them? Yes, uh, we were very happy. We were just going as we had planned, really. Uh, we were having a good run. We hope you'll have better luck on the next occasion, Bertie. Thank you. Thanks very much. The crews were allowed a 15-minute service on the quayside at Waterford before the dusty rally cars were put into Park Fermi. Harold de Moot needed that 15 minutes and more, his Audi needing a gearbox, differential and engine work. The new rally leader, however, was Henry Toivonen. Harold de Moot was second just. Billy Coleman had a fine run into third with Austin McHale pulling back to fourth. Kidney's drive to fifth was exemplary, while Davy Evans was surprising in sixth, John Price seven, Winston Henry at eight, Russell Gooding nine, and Alan Johnson, Group A leader, in tenth. Beautiful sunshine greeted circuit leader Henry Toivnan as he headed out over the new Waterford stages at seven o'clock on the Sunday morning. Demut should have been behind the Porsche, but it was Coleman who was second on the road. Yet another green bottle was about to crash. Demut's Audi engine was terminally sick. Another top 10 driver was sadly to go out. The German car made it to the service area at the Waterford Glass Factory, but it was to go no further. The ever pleasant German even had to drive those first two Sunday stages with the engine stuck at full revs, but the damage was now terminal. Demut had done a good job on the Irish tarmac stages. His chance of a good circuit placing was now gone, and also gone was the chance of European Championship points, of which the circuit is a coefficient two counter. And Price was still getting the hand signals, but flew off the road on the second of the Sunday stages, losing six minutes and dropping from seventh to ninth overall. 
Fortunately, the Renault sustained little damage. The Hereford driver was able to battle on at unabated speed. Billy Coleman was now up to second place. Behind him was Ernest Kidney, the highest placed Northern Ireland driver, in fourth. Davy Evans was up to fifth overall. And Russell Gooding makes an appearance here, lying in eighth position. The Sunday stages were mostly fast and smooth, with lots of sweeping bends and gentle crests, where the drivers were able to make their cars flow. The crowds loved it. The weather was perfect in the Waterford countryside at its beautiful best. And what crowds there were, often 10 and even 20 deep. Toivonen and used his Porsche speed to full advantage on the Sunday, stretching his lead throughout the day. The pace of the leading three was hectic, every second counting. Austin McHale lost valuable seconds when his Manta engine overheated momentarily. Apparently the fan blades broke off. Coleman in second place pushed his Opel as hard as he dared. Kidney maintained fourth, while Davy Evans in the Nissan was speeding up and about to pay the price. Russell Gooding was also charging hard. He was up to eighth position now. Winston Henry was flying in sixth place. Alan Johnson so nearly overcooked it here, but the Group A leader now had the bit between his teeth and Group A by the scruff of the neck. As Toivonen charges on, let's hark back to rally safety for just a moment. Keep an eye on the three clowns, one of them wearing a Rothmans jacket, spectating on the inside of this bend. Never a look over their shoulders as they nip in and out. Many of the drivers reported near misses with spectators on the Sunday. Indeed, many of the drivers said they actually slowed down and lost time because of them. But these three spectators, rallying could well do without. Ken McKinstry was referring there, of course, to Frank Fenner, not Pat. But unbeknown to Ken, the Dubliner Sunday was being parked just down the road, the engine terminally blown. But Finland's Henry Toivonen was still going strong as the rally headed out past Clonmel and over the knock Neil Down Mountains. The NDT packed Opel Manta 400 of Boston McHale seemed to have suffered no ill effects from its little overheating problem. Austin was to be second quickest over the day, behind Toivonen, but in front of teammate Billy Coleman. For Cork farmer Coleman, in second place, the Sunday was important, yes. Every second lost to McHale was important. But overriding everything in Coleman's eyes was the need to preserve the Opal Ireland Manta. For Coleman, this was still a five-day rally. Compared to the three cars in front, fourth place Ernest Kidney was well down in horsepower. The Lotus Sunbeam just didn't have the go of the Porsche or the Opals, but Ernest was still best of the rest, and the Robin Lands prepared and service Sunbeam was giving no problems. English driver Russell Gooding in the ex-works Vauxhall Chevette was working his way quietly up the leaderboard to hold eighth place overall. Gooding had come to the circuit with the confidence of a tenth place on the recent Portuguese rally under his belt. And looking at the crowds and the weather, Russell was probably wondering if he was still in Portugal. It was the warmest April day ever recorded in the sunny southeast.
rally passed on Garvin, Teutman was still showing his world class at the head of the field. The two Mantas battled on in second and third place, McHale using every inch of the road. John Price had recovered from his earlier Sunday accident and was now in eighth position overall. Winston Henry was thrilling the crowd with his driving style but was slowed by a broken exhaust. Mike Dunyon had made a marvellous recovery from Saturday's accident, his Chevette setting times right with the leaders. Warren Craig was doing his first rally for nearly three years, throwing the XRA Batman Ford Escort. English driver Ian Harrison was lying second in class behind McKinstry. Listen out now for the cheer that the Dungarvan crowd were to give their favourite rally driver, Marie Maloney. As Plum Tyndall and Belfast Dan Daly joined the crowds in Strad Valley to watch the leaders over the final few stages to Waterford, Toydland's lead looked secure. Coleman was now six minutes behind the leader. Billy was looking behind at his teammate McHale rather than ahead to the Porsche. The gap between the two Opals was just over a minute, too close for Coleman's comfort. Placed Ernest Kidney was nearly nine minutes behind McHale's Manta and content to let it go. Russell Gooding was still hanging on to his eighth position and having quite a battle with seven plates, John Price. Winston Henry was now fifth, super dry, but still having exhaust problems. Alan Johnson was up to ninth, and Julian Roderick had moved into tenth place. Mike Dunyon was racing up the leaderboard, while Ken McKinstry was into eleventh place. David Mann in the Corolla GT was now 12th overall. Brian Wiggins was leading Group N ahead of Jenny Burrell. And Cork's Jerry O'Flynn was still sporting his red label. After we back in 15th position earlier on, does it surprise you to have five minutes of a lead at this stage? Uh, well, for sure I didn't expect that uh, after the early problem which we had, uh, we could uh, get the cap, you know, back so, so quickly. Uh, but I suppose the secret actually why we we did it was that uh, I'm very much more experienced uh, with the note rallies when we use notes than uh, uh, the English drivers or Irish drivers so I, I gained there quite a lot and I got valuable minutes there uh, okay now I'm leading so much it's just that you know this this rally is very very hard and long and uh, the others has had a lot of problems even we were all, already in the lead when the others started to to uh, uh, to okay, talk well, this just on, just means that you know this rally you know anybody can win this after dropping a few minutes of the first days this morning Billy has asked to be putting a lot of pressure on you uh, the position is about the same we, we, we um we're trying to keep up, keep up a fairly quick pace without without losing our heads, you know. It's, but it's, it's, I think it's quite a fast pace, though. And no problem sense with the car. Uh, we have deranged the steering a little bit on a bump. That's that's all. We're going to repair it now. Keep it going, Billy. Thank you. Yeah. As the rally swept into Waterford along the coast, the Sunday dramas were not finally over. Rothmans had a go-kart demonstration on the Sunday night in Waterford's People's Park. Toivonen's go-kart was to career backwards into a tree. The rally leader was taken to hospital, appearing on Monday morning on crutches. Was still a huge mileage to do through Monday and all of Monday night to the Tuesday afternoon finish. Toivonen's leg and back injuries didn't bode well for the Finnish superstar. What appeared to have been a secure lead was now looking just a little fragile. What should have been a restful 20-hour halt in Waterford turned into a medical marathon for Henry. Worse was to follow, virtually carried to his Rothmans Porsche at the Monday restart, his German machine's gearbox started to act up on the first Monday stages. Although running on schedule here, Teuvenen was about to drop back. Billy Coleman was about to become the new Rothmans circuit leader.
Toivonen's Porsche had now lost third gear completely and was momentarily stuck in fifth. He had dropped seven minutes freeing the gearbox selectors and was now back in fourth place. A worse fate, however, was to befall driver Winston Henry. Notice co-driver John Hunter receiving substance in the background from one of the service crew, Olivia Downey, as Winston tells us what happened. Well, on, on the last stage, we were coming into a, a right-hander downhill, which was loose, and uh, uh, as we braked, uh, a heavy pothole in the steering arm sheared the two studs. A fine sick place gone for Winston Henry. The rally was now sweeping northwest through southern Ireland, with stages in counties Tipperary and Clare, before a supper halt in Galway City. As leader Billy Coleman heads the field out of the Galway Park Fermi, the circuit veteran and two times winner knows how tough the night ahead will be. Billy's father, John Coleman, helps him check his Peltor intercom. Every detail must be just right. Billy's co-driver, Ronan Morgan, looks pensive. A week before the rally, he didn't even know if he had a drive or not. And here he was leading the rally every Irishman wants to win. It's misery personified, however, for Henry Teuvenen, crutches and all. His leg and back injuries are still causing him pain. Co-driver Ian Grindrod relieves the workload by driving between stages. But the Porsche gearbox is now on its last legs. The car even having to be pushed out of service. Reverse gear has now gone. Through the darkness, few people are, are aware of just how hard Coleman and McHale are driving. It's 10 tenths on every stage. With three of the original top 10 seeds left in the rally, another green bottle is about to hit the deck. At a service area on the main Sligo to Ballyshannon Road, the poor service crew tried to change the gearbox. In at a quarter past three, it had to be out at a quarter to four, but there's no chance. Circuit winner of 20 years ago, Ronnie McCartney, comforts Henry. And the Finnish superstar who thrilled the circuit spectators would have been leading the European Championship if he could have won. But now there were two green bottles left. As dawn breaks over the Donegal countryside, it's the Dubliner Austin McHale in the lead, now suffering from flu but driving his heart out. Billy Coleman, leading earlier in the evening, and how often do you see the County Cork farmer locking wheels, is now in second place. It certainly had been a long, tough night. Drivers are heading to breakfast at Letterkenny. The stages up at the northernmost tip of Donegal had been bumpy and tough, and the bright sunshine that was now past. For most crews, it was a matter of keeping station and out of trouble. McHale's lead over Coleman was over a minute at Letterkenny. The Cork farmer was telling everyone at breakfast his challenge was over. But he was to make one last charge. The stage after breakfast was a 12-miler called Glen the Finn. McHale was still leading, but relaxed. His lead looked secure. Coleman was flying. He took 23 seconds off the Dubliner. Still, Austin had enough in hand. But on the very next stage, there was a shattering noise of yet another green bottle falling off a wall. McHale was out. His engine cracked open, oil everywhere. Coleman was the new and final circuit leader. For the Dubliner, his co-driver, Christy Farrell, and all the hard-working mechanics, it was hard to take in, so near and yet so far. For Coleman, all he had to do was cruise the Manta through the last three stages to Belfast. The pace had been so hot and heavy that the gap to second place was a massive 20 minutes, a lifetime in rallying's timescale. Looking back over the circuit and those nine green bottles that fell off the wall, it was always Coleman who maintained from the start that the pace was too fast. He wanted to conserve the car. That thought was uppermost in his mind throughout the five days. Ironically, three weeks after the circuit, as this tape was being edited, news came through that Coleman's engine had a crack in it, just like McHale's, and he was lucky to finish. But what finish he did. On the final run into Belfast, it was English driver Tim Bryce in eighth place. His sunbeam had led Group A at one point until troubles intervened. David Mann in seventh finished third Group A car. His Toyota had had alternator problems which slowed him down in the final night. 
Lawnmower mechanic Ken McKinstry had driven his brother Sam's supposedly outdated RS2000 to a splendid second in Group A. For Alan Johnson and Bobby Willis in the C-Link supported Corolla, it was a fairy tale, trouble-free rally, a Group A victory and fifth overall. John Price in fourth drove better than anyone can ever remember, like his old days in the Porsches, but he does need to practice those handbrake turns. Davy Evans on his first ever rally, to finish third on the circuit, it was marvellous. He had now lost all interest in hot rods. For second place to Ernest Kidney, the 84 circuit memory must have a special place on his mantelpiece. The last green bottle and circuit victors, Billy Coleman and Ronan Morgan. The Ulster Automobile Club organised a superb five-day Rothman Circuit of Ireland under the iron guidance of Clark of the Course, Donald Grieve. This is Brian Patterson hoping you enjoyed the Cork Video Services tape of this epic five-day battle.